there, it's Shannon Matchick Myers. Today we'll be checking out section 13.2, which covers lim limits and continuity. We're working out of the Larson and Edwards uh, calculus text. And our goals today will be to understand the definition of a delta neighborhood in the plane, understand and use the definition of the limit of a function of two variables, and then extend the concept of continuity to both the function of two variables and a function of three variables. So let's go ahead and warm it on up, pause the movie, warm it on up. We're going to uh, just do some stuff from Calc 1 uh, just to remind us a little bit about limits. So pause the movie, on your mark, get set, go! You can do it. All right, let's see how you did. Um, this is a good way, I'll probably be showing a little more work than you. I want to show properties of limits because they're going to apply to functions of more than one variable. So here, if you recall, this we can rewrite this limit as 2 times the limit as x approaches c of f at x. So I used two properties right there in the numerator, the fact that the constant can go in or out of the limit, and um, now I'm using the fact that a quotient of limits is the, or the limit of a quotient, sorry, is the quotient of the limits, as long as the limit in the denominator is non-zero. So, here we go. We'll have the limit as x approaches c of g at x in that denominator. So what's going to happen? We're just going to get 2 times beautiful negative 8 over 6. And that's because the output of this limit here is negative 8 right here. And the output of this limit here is 6. So remember your properties of limits um, and then what's going to happen when we divide out we'll end up getting the end result of this limit so our z value if you will is going to be approaching negative eight-thirds. Good so far? Awesome. All right, so next up, this limit, um, remember if you've got the limit of the composition of functions, um, you can basically bring the limit inside or out. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to say that this is equal to the cube root of the limit as x approaches c of f at x, okay? And then that in turn will be the cube root of negative 8, which is just negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. Beautiful. So again, I just plugged in the knowledge I had about the output for this limit and um, I substituted it into the cube root. Groovy? All right. So in this section, we'll be checking out limits and continuity. of functions of two or more, or actually we're really just doing two or three variables. So we begin by defining a two-dimensional dimensional, okay, <laughs> analog to an interval on the real number line. Using the formula for the distance between two points, let's call them um, x and y and x0, y0. In the plane, what we can do is we can define what's called the delta neighborhood.
about x0, y0 to be the disk which is centered at x0, y0 with radius delta. And delta, of course, is going to be greater than zero, right? So the, the uh, set of ordered pairs x and y is defined to be the distance between x, y, and x, zero, y, zero. So we'd have x minus x, zero, the quantity squared, plus y minus y, zero the quantity squared. And that, of course, has to be less than our delta. So the, the distance the formula there is our radius, right, uh, or is the distance between the two points, but our radius is delta, right? So that, that expression has to be less than delta. Good so far for x and y. All right, so when this formula contains the less than inequality sign, which is that symbol there, the disk is called open. And when it contains the less than or equal to inequality sign, which looks like this, the disk is called closed. This corresponds to the use of less than and less than or equal to define open and closed intervals. So what we really have, you know, kind of going on here for an open disk is here you'd have basically some sort of x0, y0 Right, so you've got, I don't know, let's, let's say it's like right here. This is my x0, y0. And remember that what, what's happening is that delta is, delta was defined to be, right, the radius, so delta had to be positive. So radius delta, which was greater than zero. So if we were to take a look, at um, this here, let's just say this is our, our delta, then imagine sweeping it around and then we would have, we would have our open disk. So we're gonna dash this as a circle. That looks relatively circular there. So here, basically what happens is you've got this region this region inside um, this dashed Sorry, that should be dashed. The, re the region inside here and you know these are the boundary points are not included. Cool, cool? All right, so here you've got you've got this delta which is greater than zero which forms the radius of this this um, open region which we call a disk okay so if we let the region call it r right be a set of points in the plane a point x0 y0 in r is an interior point of this region R, or if there exists some delta neighborhood about this, this point, x0, y0, that lies entirely within R, 
okay? So if every point in R is an interior point, then R is, what do you think? Beautiful and open region. Now, a point X0, Y0 is a boundary point of R if every open disk centered at X0, Y0 contains points that are inside R and outside R. If R contains all its boundary points, then R is a closed region. So let, let's just make a, a little picture of that closed region. All right, so here, imagine that, I mean, this, this one we did up here first, this is just like a zoomed up snapshot of, of some, you know, interior, or it, it could be an interior or boundary point, so just some X0, Y0, okay, that's part of the uh, region R. Now, if we sort of think about it as zooming out, I'm sorry, <laughs> my leftiness is keeping me from getting it level here, I can't see what I'm see the line. All right, so let's say we've just got this 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 region, okay? And um and we'll we'll make it a closed region. So like that. So now basically this is the the kind of idea. So again, this is some this is our some region. And actually, you know what? Let's do it a different, a different color. I'll, I'll, I'll um, I want to do it a different color because it's not necessarily that same deal. So we'll just make whatever some random region. So basically, what's going to happen here in this region, which I've created right here. Right, so it consists of you know infinitely many points in the interior and on the boundary, and so what we've got going on is this. If you were to take a look at, if you were to take a look at an interior point within this region, um, I think I think this will show up. So basically, if you have an interior point, what this paragraph before was trying to say is that if you've got your delta greater than zero, so I'll zoom in here, you've got your delta greater than zero, so this is your a little delta right here, and then what, did, what happened with the delta, remember it, was, it swept around and made a circle around the point right? And so this delta basically is around our, whoops, sorry, is around this, this interior point. So this point is an interior point in R, okay? Now, similarly, if you're looking at a boundary point, again, you've got this delta, right, which is greater than zero, and that delta, again, sweeps around, and if it's on the boundary, it would be both outside and inside of your, sorry, that's not a very good uh, circle, I'm trying to, inside and outside of our region. So that's what's gonna happen um, for are boundary points. So this guy is a boundary point. 
Cool so far? All right, so here we go. Official definition of the limit of a function of two variables. So let's let f be a function of two variables defined except possibly at x0, y0 on an open disk centered at x0, y0 and let L be a real number. Then it turns out that the limit as some x and y approaches x0, y0, so it's a little more complicated, of f of x and y is equal to L if for each epsilon greater than zero, so this should look familiar, there corresponds a delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of f of x and y minus L less than epsilon is less than epsilon whenever zero is less than, now we're going to put in the distance between those two points x and y and x0, y0. Whenever that is less than delta. Okay? So let's just make a little, you know, 3D visual. This will be very rough. <laughs> So this would be like our z, our x, and our y, right? And let's also say that we've we've got this this um, this disk, okay? This disk. So it's like that first image we we drew. So remember how we had um, we had some point that was like our x zero y zero. And remember that we had delta, some positive value delta, and it made an open disk, something like that. Like I said, it's it's very, very rough. All right, so it made this this open open disk. All right, and um, so now you've got you've got that open disk, and basically any point x and y that's in there, right, has to um, it it has to be somewhere within that distance of the radius, right? So here, if you just you know notice that any point x and y as long as it's on the interior disk will will fit that requirement, right? So you'd have just, you know, some x, y. So now, so now what will happen is we're going to look, you know, you would be looking at some volume right, some volume um, or some, some three-dimensional uh, deal here. So let's just say that what we had, you know, was some, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make a, a, a cone, right, so, and it's going to be a lot, you know, this is a huge representation of the, of the delta, so I'll just make it look something like this. Okay, so you've got you've got some some visual, but basically what's going to happen is you're going to be going up, and 
these guys are going to be going up into your into your shape so hopefully I made it big enough something like that and I'm not going to get fancy with the with the 3d but basically what's happening is we want to make sure right you've got you're going to have some you know some values right you're going to have some l right some l minus some l minus epsilon and then some l plus epsilon where epsilon is some small positive number right now what you'll have here this here remember is our disk of radius delta and so what's happening is that if you kind of map these up to the output right you'll have you'll 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 be it'll come up you know somewhere and um, so you would have and actually let's call those this point right here we'll call it x1 y1 instead so we'll say x1 and y1 and then um, all right so here we go so now the x0 y0 right it 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 lands somewhere in our you know in here it's it's basically these all anything that's in here any point that's in here that meets the requirement has to land within somewhere within um L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon okay so let's just take a look I've got a little bit more to say about it let's um, let's just take a look here and um, and then we'll move on to some examples so graphically the definition of a function of two variables implies that for any point X Y which is not equal to the center of that open disk, which is x0, y0, right? In the disk of radius delta, the value, the output, f at xy, lies between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. So the critical difference between the definition of a limit of two variables and the definition of the limit of one variable is that to determine whether the limit of a function of a single, sorry, variable exists, you need only test the approach from two directions, from the left and from the right. Remember that? But now we're in, and so if the one-sided limits exist and are equal, the limit exists. Um, but for a function of two variables, you could come from any direction. It doesn't have to just be from the left or the right as you trace the graph. You know, as, as it can come from anywhere around that, that point. And so it's a little bit more difficult to ascertain. So this, this statement, x and y approaches x0, y0, basically means that the point x y is allowed to approach x zero y zero from any direction so if the value of the limit as x and y approaches x zero y zero of f of x and y is not the same for all possible approaches or paths to x0, y0, then the limit does not exist. So 
let that percolate a little bit. Let's do some examples. A lot of this we can look at graphically. This is just a precursor so we can we can learn about um, you know our partial derivatives and, and all of that for functions of more than one variable. So here we go. Use the definition of the limit of a function of two variables to verify the limit. So what all do we have to do? Um, what is our function of x and y? Beautiful. Our function of x and y is just y because that's what's inside the limit. So what's our evil plan? We need to show that for each epsilon which is greater than zero, there exists a delta neighborhood. which is about this point AB. Such that the absolute value of F at X and Y minus L. And what will that be equal to? What was F of X and Y? Beautiful, f of x and y was just y, right? So, and then our, our limit L, by definition, is this B. So that's what that inequality is equal to, and that all has to be less than epsilon. Cool so far? And that has to be true whenever x and y which is not equal to the point A, B, lies in the neighborhood. Okay, so from zero less than, so we're utilizing this from our definition, less than the distance between x, y, and a, b, we would have x, the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is between zero and delta, non-inclusive, right? And so, it follows that from what we were working of up there, remember we had had that absolute f of x and y minus l was equal to absolute y minus b, but what is absolute y minus b? Beautiful, you could call that the square root of quantity y minus b squared, couldn't you? Cool. All right, so now that in turn has to be less than or equal to that whole square root, right? Which was x minus a, the quantity squared, plus y minus b, the quantity squared, and that in turn has to be less than delta. So why don't we just let delta be equal to epsilon and the limit is verified. Groovy? 
All right, very good. So moving on, let's go ahead and use the following limits to find the limit of interest. So I, I, these are kind of similar to what we worked before. I put different outputs, but I just wanted to bring to mind that the properties for limits extend to functions of two variables. So what would we do here? Awesome, we would say that this guy here would be two times the limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x and y over the limit, sorry about the dogs, <laughs> as x and y approaches a x y approaches a b of our g of x and y but what is that going to be that's going to be two times beautiful negative 64 over negative two and that is from this limit having an output of negative 64 and then the other limit for the G having an output of negative 2. Cool, cool? All right, so the negative 2's divide out. Um, actually, the 2's divide out, the negatives um, go to positive and we'll just get positive 64. Groovy? All right, awesome. So next up, again, you can use properties of limits to bring the limit into the cube root. So this will be equivalent to the cube root of the limit as x and y approaches a, b of f of x and y. Well, that's just going to be the cube root of negative 64, which is negative 4. Cool, cool? All right, and that was from, again, properties, using properties of limits and um, how the, these, uh, the values these particular limits were given to have. All right? Okay, so now let's go into continuity of a function of two variables. A function f of two variables is continuous at a point x0, y0 in an open region R if f at x0, y0 is defined, sorry, and is equal to the limit of f of x and y as x and y, x, y approaches x0, y0. So just like before, there were three conditions when you were looking at a function of a single variable. The limit had to exist, right? And the function value had to exist, and those two results had to be equal to each other. So they're just kind of shortening it. Instead of saying one, two, three, they're putting it, we're putting it just in one um, sentence here. So symbolically, what has to happen is the limit as the ordered pair x, y approaches x0, y0 of f at x and y has to have an output of f at x0, y0. So the limit as you're approaching x0, y0 of the function has to equal to the function value when you input x0, y0. Cool, cool? All right, the function f is continuous in the open region r if it is continuous at every point in r. All right, now continuous functions of two variables. So if k is a real number and f at x and y, whoops, sorry, a typo here. If k is a real number, 
and f of x and y and g of x and y are continuous at x0, y0, then the following functions are also continuous at x0, y0. So the scalar multiple of constant times a function, the, the product, which would be the product of the functions, sum or difference, f plus or minus g, and then the quotient. So it, the quotient would you know, be the, they'd be continuous as long as both f and g are continuous and um, g at x0, y0 is not equal to 0 because you still don't want a 0 in the denominator. Cool, cool? All right, so next up, continuity of a composite function. So so if h is continuous at x0, y0, and g is continuous at h at x0, y0, then the composite function given by g composed with h at x and y is equal to g evaluated at h of x and y, and that is continuous at x0, y0. So that, what does that mean? That means that the limit as x and y approaches x0, y0, of g at h at x and y is equal to g at h evaluated at x0, y0. So note that h is a function of two variables, but g in this theorem is a function of just one variable. Cool, cool? Now we're going we're gonna to extend the definition of continuity of a function to three variables. Oh, it looks like I've got a typo here. This should be three variables. So a function f of three variables is continuous at a point x0, y0, z0 in an open region R if f at x0, y0, z0 is defined and is equal to the limit of f at x, y, and z as x, y, and z approaches x0, y0, z0. So again, that is the limit as x, y, z approaches x0, y0, z0 of our f at x, y, z has to equal to the function f evaluated at x0, y0, z0. The function f is continuous in the open region r if it is continuous at every point in r. Cool, cool? Okay. For our third example, we're going to find the indicated limit and discuss the continuity of the function. So here, well, let's just try, you know, direct substitution and see if it works out, right? So if we directly substitute um, 2 for x and 4 for y, what's going to happen? We're going to get 2 plus 4 over 2 squared plus 1. So all I did is wherever I saw an x, I put a 2, and wherever I saw a y, I put a 4, all right? And so this will end up being, what, 6 fifths. Now as far as the continuity, if you take a look here at our denominator, just like before, you're taking an x value and you're squaring it, and then you're increasing it by 1. So this would, this would be continuous everywhere. So f is continuous everywhere. Okay, now again, let's take a look at this one. Now we have a function of three variables x, y, and z. So here, if you notice, we have, we basically have, you know, 
a product of two continuous functions. There's no there's no discontinuities in x and there's no discontinuities in e raised to the yz and there's no discontinuities in y times z, right, in that composition. So let's just directly substitute and see what we get. So here um, we would end up having negative 2 in for x and then e would be raised to the product 1 times 0. So wherever I see a y, I'm putting a 1. Wherever I see an x, I put a negative 2. And where I saw a z, I put 0. Okay, so um, this just gives us what? Beautiful, negative 2 e to the 0, which will just be negative 2. And again, our if our function, if if f of x and this one I called f of x and y was equal to our x plus y over x squared plus one. And this one, if we call our f of x, y, and z equal to x e raised to the y z, we can say that f is continuous everywhere. Okay, so moving right along, um, example four, find the indicated limit if it exists. If it doesn't exist, explain why. Well, I hope you can see that this is sort of a, a problem child right here because um, as x and y approaches zero, zero, um, that denominator is gonna zero out. Even if one of either x or y was zero, the denominator would zero out. So for stuff like this, what we'll do why don't we go ahead and take a look at a picture of it? So, okay, so here we're um, at, I'm putting in sliders for, for X and Y, okay, so that we can see what's happening. Now, do you see, whoops, in here, the in the corner there um, for at X and Y, equal x is negative 10, y is negative 10. So here, as you move x, and remember, what are we approaching? We're approaching zero. And so if you take a look, what's happening? So we're pretty close here. I'll turn it for us. So here we're at, here we're at negative 2 tenths for our x, and at y, where I'll go to when we're at negative two tenths as well, okay? And where did where did we go? Okay, so what's happening? Do you see? Is that it's it's tending infinitely upward. So if we if we were to at, put you know, um, let's see where our z is for our settings here. Let's put our Z up at 100. Okay, so let's let's just um, kind of explore. Let's try to find our point here. Um, and so here, our y. Do you see our point is right here? Okay, and this is x is too far away. So here we're just 
we're just above um, zero. So what's happening is our our x and our y are both being squared, and so as as x and y get both very close to to zero from either side, what's happening is there it's going to increase without bound, right? So if we take a look here, and and, and you'll you'll see if we went to let's go to one one so do you see f at one one is just one you can see in the upper corner there and so our point is right here and so as we increase what's happening is that it's getting our y value and um, because remember x x and y are being multiplied together and squared. So as they get larger and larger, what's happening is we're we're getting to kind of like this 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 plane that serves as an asymptote, right? Um, and then as we get closer and closer to x and y equaling to zero, they are increasing without bound, right? So this limit is not going to exist, and that is why. So my scale, of course, you know, is is off. I don't have all of the, you know, the Z stuff. I think my upper and lower are clipped at, at 4, negative 4. So maybe this is a better visual. See where we are there. Um, uh, so here we um you can see right where our point is so it's really pretty interesting um but you can see that it's going to increase without bound um as as we approach as we approach zero from both the the left and the right side all right so just to recap um our ordered pair our ordered pair or ordered triple is right here right um this was happening as you know as we get closer and closer to zero, our function value um, for both x and y, our function value was get it was increasing without bound. So here, what we're gonna say is we're gonna say that that this this uh, limit does not exist, right? And the reason that the finite limit doesn't exist is that it's increasing without bound. In other words, the the z values are headed to infinity. As x and y approach zero zero cool now as far as continuity goes right we just don't want x or y to be zero so if you looked at the domain of this function right our domain of this function would be x and y such that x and y are elements are elements of the real numbers, a set of real numbers, and x and y are both non-zero, not equal to zero. Cool, cool? And with this one, we could look at our range too. Notice we have, we're not gonna have any negative z values. We're always gonna get positive um, values out here. So our range would be If we call you know call it f of x and y, or you could say z, such that f of x and y numbers and f of x and y is greater than zero. Cool, cool. So I think that went a little beyond what the problem asked for, but that's okay. 
All right, so now again, let's go to the, the graph for this guy. Although, I mean, if you check, if you kind of check this one out and think about it, I mean, what, what's gonna have to be true? I mean, if you directly substitute, do you see, what do we get? We end up getting beautiful zero over zero, right? Two minus one minus one is zero, and the square root of two minus one is one, and when you take away one, you get zero. So that means it's indeterminate in this form. But you know, there's a radical there, so there is something we could do. I mean, do you remember, way back when when you would um, we often would rationalize the numerator let's just try rationalizing the denominator so if we want to generate a difference of square situation we could do root x minus y plus one and then over root x minus y plus one and so in the denominator what will happen is we will end up with the limit as x and y approaches to 1 of, so keeping the numerator not, we're not expanding the numerator, we're just going to write those two factors. And then in the denominator, let's see what we'll get root x minus y times root x minus y is just x minus y and then we end up with minus 1 squared which is minus 1 and so look we've got this problem child in the denominator divides out and let's see what happens I think we'll end up being okay so this, if we, if we want to clean it up just a little bit, make it prettier, the limit as x and y approaches to 1, it'll just be of the square root of x minus y plus 1 without, with just a 1 in that denominator. And so directly substituting, what do we have? Beautiful. We'll have root 2 minus 1 plus 1. So wherever I saw the y, I put a 1. And wherever I saw the x, I put a 2. So that leaves us with a result of 2. We're getting a lot of results of 2 today, aren't we? But let's take a look at the graph of this as well. Now, um, let's take a look we're approaching the point 2, 1, right? So 1.8, 1, 1.8, 1, 1.2, you see it's pretty darn close to 2. And so if I go exactly to y is 1, I'm even closer to 2, right, um, for the output. And let me go to x is exactly 2. Now, f at 2, 1, they're saying is equal to 0, right? And so let's take a look. And do you see that that point isn't on the plane? And so I think what this, has, this um, program has done is just redefined it because, um, because that, that it's going to end up being restricted from the from the domain uh, so but as we get as we get you know if we look at it from each side so if we look at two let's do like 2.1 and 1.1 right do you see that up in that left corner f of 2.1 comma 1 is 2.04880885 right and then if we go the other way, we go to 0 0.99, I guess, and then we go to 1.99. Notice that we're coming right up on 2. Okay, so, so as we're approaching, you know, from that, that disk, right, as, as we're approaching, you can, you know, think of our, our the you can look at the planar region on the left, and as, as we're approaching that disk, what's happening is we are, um, 
approaching we are approaching um, a z value of two okay so let's go to our default view and that's kind of cool we'll keep that one there all right all right so there's the visual of what we were looking at and remember that this was this was our ordered pair right here cool cool all right so um now let's go and take a look at another thing we can do is we can use polar coordinates to find the limit um and sometimes that does help simplify things and note that as x and y approaches zero zero r will also approach zero so we'll use polar and then spherical to look at these limits and then go from there okay so using um, polar coordinates remember does anybody remember what what x is so that would end up being the limit as r approaches zero of beautiful r cosine theta the quantity cubed that's what x is in polars and then y I'm sorry, R sine theta, the quantity cubed. And then recall that X squared plus Y squared is just R squared. Cool so far? Awesome. And so we would end up with the limit as R approaches zero of R cubed cosine cubed theta plus R cubed sine cubed theta over r squared. Dividing out an r squared from each term, we'll just have the limit as r approaches zero of r cosine cubed theta plus r sine cubed theta. Cool? So, putting in zero for r now doesn't have an issue because it's no longer in that denominator. So at the end of the day, we'll just get, um, well, I'd, you'd have, you know, zero for r times cosine zero cubed is still zero. And then zero times sine zero cubed is zero with our direct substitution. And that is a result of zero. Cool, cool? All right, so now let's look at using spherical coordinates to find the limit. So here as x, y, and z approaches zero, 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 rho approaches zero from the right. So here we go. We have the limit as x, y, z approaches zero, zero, zero of one over quantity x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So now, what do you think is going to happen with this? Good. Remember that that would end up just being the limit as rho approaches zero from the right of one over rho squared because um, that's what x squared plus y squared plus z squared is. And as we're approaching that from the right, where are we going to go? It would go to infinity, right? So the, the finite limit does not exist, right? So it all depends on how the question is phrased um, or if you're looking for where's the graph going, blah, 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 all that. Cool, cool? Okay, now our last example, we're gonna find each of these limits, okay? And um, this is going to prepare us for um, partial derivatives. So very exciting. All right, so here we go. Our function of x and y is one over x plus y. So this would be equivalent to the limit as delta x approaches zero of one over x plus delta x plus y, right? And then minus 
1 over x plus y. x plus delta x comma y is the first fraction, and f of x and y is the second fraction. And this is all over our delta x. So now, getting a common denominator, right? So for this one, what do we need? The first one, we, we just need x plus y. The second one, we're going to need x plus delta x plus y. And so, cleaning it up, we'll have the limit as delta x approaches 0 of x plus y minus x minus delta x minus y distributing that, that negative through. That's going to be over x plus y times x plus delta x plus y. And then times, I'm going to invert and multiply the 1 over delta x. Groovy? All right. Well, this cleans up quite a bit. We'll get the limit as delta x approaches 0 of the x is 0 out and the y is 0 out, so we'll get negative delta x over x plus y times x plus delta x plus y times 1 over delta x. And so this delta x divides that one out. Don't forget about your negative. So at the end of the day, with direct substitution, we're going to get negative 1 over x plus y times x plus 0 plus y. So I guess it's not quite the end of the day, but so remember, wherever we see a delta x, we're going to be putting in a 0. and. So our end result for the limit would be negative 1 over x plus y, the quantity squared. Cool, cool? All right, why don't you try doing the next limit, which is evaluating the limit as delta x approaches 0, uh, and then we're doing that f of x comma y plus delta y. You can do it. I know you can. Okay, let's see how you did. So, this will equal to the limit as delta y approaches 0 of 1 over x plus y plus delta y plus 1 over x plus y all over delta y. Cool, cool. And again, getting a common denominator, this guy on the right is going to need x plus y plus delta y. Oh, and my bad, I have a sign wrong. This should have been a subtraction. All right. And over x plus y plus delta y. And then the first one just needed x plus y. All right. So cleaning it up, let's see what we got. We'll have the limit as delta y approaches 0 of x plus y minus x minus y minus delta y all over x plus y times x plus y plus delta y and then times 1 over delta y. And again, don't forget about your negative. We'll have the limit as delta y approaches 0 of 
negative delta y over x plus y times x plus y plus delta y times 1 over delta y. Dividing out the delta y's and remembering that we still have that negative, we'll have with direct substitution negative 1 over x plus y times x plus y plus 0 because delta y is approaching 0 in this case, right? And that gives us the same result, negative 1 over x plus y, the quantity squared. Cool, cool? All right, so that's it for, t that's it for today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you're watching this show. And if, hey, if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe. Bye-bye.